Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 71 of our series, uh, Libraries in Response. Uh, we started three years ago with the arrival of the pandemic, and we've been holding these basically every other week since then. And that's what this amounts to now is uh, 71. Excuse me. Is that working? Yes, that My is. Memories. Thanks, great. Uh, so this is part of our broadband from space series focusing on, well, how to get broadband from, from outer space as opposed to the terrestrial networks where nearly all of us get our internet access. Um, We've had a, a special emphasis on this, the arrival of low Earth orbit satellites. And that's what we're going to be talking about today for the most part. But it's not the only satellite system or broadband from space system. There's also the traditional geostationary satellites. We'll get into those in another session, but today we're going to mostly focus on low Earth orbit. Uh, my name is Don Means. Uh, we are the Gubit Libraries Network, open consortium collaboration of libraries doing interesting things with technology uh, mostly related to communications but not only our host is the international federation of library associations and institutions ifla uh, based in the hague and our series sponsor is the internet society which is, of course we're going to have uh, good representation today uh, related to the internet society thank you very much our media sponsor is Broadband Breakfast. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a, a quote from Larry, one of our speakers today. And we'll see shared accounts in government commercial telecenters, Wi-Fi hotspots. This gets to the heart of our, our mm, reason uh, related to communications is that libraries and other kinds of hubs, community centers, offer a response to the uh, multiple challenges uh, to adoption. Uh, Nakim, Varengai, and Larry will uh, give us news today. Uh, our, our Broadband from Space uh, series has a focus today on into Africa. It's a little play on out of Africa, but now after all these, all this time technology that has come from humans who emerged from Africa is going back into Africa, and we think it may make a difference in how connectivity happens there. So um, these are the different aspects of this particular uh, thread is how to expand access, enhance uh, services, especially public services and also to increase resilience against uh, disasters, which is more and more of our normal environment these days as the climate uh, warms and increases severity of, and, and frequency of uh, extreme weather events. Classically, to help close the global digital divide, where we have nearly still nearly 3 billion people who are offline and, uh, and waiting for service, waiting for the infrastructure to arrive, which it just tends to not because of the classic infrastructure model, which is the farther you are away from the core of any network, the more expensive it is to deliver services. And as you get further out, there are fewer people, making it more expensive per person, per household, and also those people tend to have less money. So this is a disincentive to actually extend infrastructure. It's classic. Uh, but uh, the, the basic principle has been that once a, a service has been deemed as a basic service, essential service, then everyone should have affordable access to it. Telephone, electricity, it's not true everywhere, but that's the principle of universal service. And how this may uh, affect the uh, wider telecom ecosystem is, is also a fascinating aspect of it. We've identified these main er barriers to adoption. This is a kind of an arbitrary taxonomy on this uh, particular topic, but availability is uh, certainly there, affordability and usability. If it's not available, then the other two really are moot questions. And then once it is, then is it affordable? This is one of the topics we're gonna get to today. And then usability is, is really a, a catchphrase for a whole bunch of different issues 
related to devices. Why do I care? What's it good for? How do I use it? And so on. So between this is our take on LEO is that it fills the availability gap in this classic uh, uh, um, barrier. Uh, but is it affordable? Well, if you introduce a library or a community hub, then they can address both the affordability and the usability questions because that's where people can go to get devices, access, um, support, training, and the rest of it. So just between that technology, low Earth orbit satellites, and these facilities, you have basically solved or addressed, if not entirely, barriers to adoption. I mean, everybody would like to have, you know, fiber to their home, but, you know, that's ultimate, but it's just not going to happen very quickly. Um, according to the United Nations, Africa, as many people may be aware, is uh, exploding in population, especially uh, younger age people. So 70% of Sub-Saharan Africa is under 30 years old. Um, and the use, uh, the connectivity primary use is uh, with uh, phones. And it's growing rapidly, still rapidly. I thought this interesting because not only is the mobile a primary device of connection, but uh, by a factor of three to one to uh, laptops, desktops, but the tablets only have a minuscule portion of this uh, uh, of this market. I would uh, uh, offer that that infers that this is a low uh, a low connectivity level for residences. If you're if you're in a household, a tablet is really a convenient device to connect, you know, versus lo via local Wi-Fi. But if you don't, then, you know, you've got your uh, phone and then laptops, desktops for a few and for institutional use, maybe explain that graph. Um, the pandemic has really elevated the uh, notion that this is an essential service. And this is verified here by uh, uh, the regional vice president of the African Internet Society branch, DeWitt Bekele. And it's, it's well-spoken. The highest growth rate of internet is in Africa, but of course that's from 1% to 30%. And, and that still leaves a huge numbers of people, 840 million people don't have reliable, affordable internet access. It's just intolerable uh, given, the, given the technology that we have today. And this is where we think LEO can come in. The other part, as I'd mentioned earlier, is not just expanding access and equity uh, to uh, digital service and content. It's also the potential for uh, these technologies to increase uh, community resilience against these uh, extreme weather events, which are coming and they're not going to stop and they're predicted to increase, which is very credible. These are images of, these are all US images, but you could find these same kinds of phenomena anywhere in the world. Uh, right now, Argentina is experiencing extreme heat. We've seen these kinds of storms in, in uh, uh, oh, everywhere and uh, flooding, fires, the rest of it. This is our, this is not only our future, this is our present. Uh, this is a list of <laughs> billion dollar disasters, and you can just see how how extreme this is getting, how expensive it's getting. Um, climate change in Africa, despite its low contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, remains the most vulnerable continent. I mean, you talk about unfair, uh, but this is uh, why uh, this is Bill McKibben, a noted uh, climate activist thinking that connecting libraries and community access hubs for resilience is a good idea, primarily because it's a way to uh, compensate partially for these, uh, uh, these heavy effects. Uh, and it's actually a low cost way to increase resilience in these communities. Our point, and that's our last point, I'll turn to the speakers, is there are two elements of response to this uh, climate disaster, climate crisis, and one is mitigation, of course, and, and reversal. Uh, these are large-scale uh, uh, 
actors that have to make the move here. Uh, the, 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 the large countries, the, the financial institutions that are maintaining the current system that's uh, uh, pouring more carbon into the atmosphere. Last year, more carbon went into the atmosphere than any time before that. So we're not doing very well in mitigation. The other part of this, adaptation scales at any level, uh, global to local to even household. And this is where we think that, that libraries have a, an opportunity to play a significant role at the community level. And communities, when, when things go wrong, there's, that's who you turn to is the people around you, physically around you are the people that, that need your help and you can provide help to. And libraries can play a key role in that. So to our uh, speakers, we're very fortunate to have uh, Larry, Kim, and Brangai uh, with us today to talk about um, connectivity in Africa, low Earth orbit, and uh, the general background there. Uh, well, we'll let them introduce their particular focuses for today. I'm going to stop screen share there. And turn that over to Larry Press. Larry, thank you for joining us. I'm going to. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Let me share my screen now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Wait a minute. One second. Here's the little guy. All right, there it is, full screen. Okay, guys. Um, I'm going to talk on. This is the topic is uh, Leo, and I'm going to be stressing there not only Leo satellites but fixed connectivity. And here's a quick outline. I'll try to run through this all fast and we can have time for a discussion afterwards if, if it's too fast. Um, hey Larry, I, I failed yeah. to introduce you properly and for all of our speakers, please you know, tell us who you are and you know, why you're here. Oh, okay. I thought you introduced me just fine. I'm Larry Press and um, long time interest in uh, the internet in developing nations. And um, I'm a retired now. I'm, I'm going to quit teaching. An emeritus professor of information systems. Uh, is that enough? Well, uh, all right. So here, here's what I'm going to run through real quickly. Um, and let's start out with the state of the Internet in Africa. Oops. That's not right. How can I back up? Can I? No. Shit. Is there a way to? I have to get out of screen sharing to back this nope, thing up. Be able to use your uh, back arrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. I was using the mouse, not the not the not uh, the arrows. All right. Just uh, background. This is no surprise to anybody. Um, showing the percentage of individuals using the internet in Africa uh, is lower than uh, the other regions. Uh, also, if you see on the right there, it's um, obviously low income regions don't use the Internet very much. Uh, the, the little red dots are kind of cool. Those show you the uh, percentage of young people using the Internet. And again, Africa uh, trails and that's uh, that's not a good sign. Um, <clears throat> as Don pointed out. There's an uh, awful lot of that use, use is mobile. Uh, there's a heavy reliance on mobile connectivity. And as you can see here, uh, the predominant uh, mobile infrastructure is still 3G, uh, greater than 50%. Uh, and 5G is barely taking off. So uh, there is mobile infrastructure, but even that is uh, kind of lagging. And uh, this is in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, now, this is just, uh, if you go back to the title, I stress that I'm going to talk about fixed connectivity and uh, want to, again, I think Don kind of really get, got at this, uh, fixed connectivity and mobile connectivity are, are two different animals. Uh, and here's uh, an example that kind of really illustrates that point. 
uh, the average, this is 2021, so it's probably gone up somewhat, but the point's the same. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the average mobile data conception was 2.9 uh, gig per month. Uh, and the second bullet there is uh, talking about an internet service provider called POA, and they provide home connectivity at four megabits per second. And their uh, average uh, usage is over 200 gigabits per month, gigabytes per month. So uh, obviously people do different things and they do a lot more uh, when they've got a, a fixed connection, in this case, in their home. Uh, kind of along the same lines, uh, different applications. You, you do different things when you're holding a cell phone than when you're working in a laptop. Uh, you, you Mainly at phones, people uh, do social media. Uh, they do kind of interactions, that kind of thing. Uh, but they're not creating content, for example. I would hate to have to have created this presentation on my phone. Um, I couldn't have done it, obviously. So that's why I'm again, I'm going to talking, I'm thinking of fixed um, access more than mobile. Um, we saw in this slide back that uh, mobile infrastructure in Africa is is kind of behind what the rest of the world's up to. Uh, I'm on a 5G connection, and I'm sure uh, if I'm on using my phone and um, so are many other people. And the same goes for fiber infrastructure. Uh, what this is kind of a cool graph that it shows the uh, the share of the population living within 25 kilometers of an operational uh, fiber optic network node in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is 2021, so it's probably gone up. Uh, I'm sure it's gone up since then, uh, but it's still it's only 57 percent. So this says that it's it's hard to reach. Uh, rural Africa and, and great parts of Africa uh, with fiber. And uh, the growth rate looks like it's declining a little bit on, on this graph as well. Um, and this is where satellites come in. They have an advantage in that it's, um, they're able to reach these difficult uh, uh, rural and para-urban areas. Uh, I learned the word para-urban while preparing these slides. Maybe everybody knew it, but not me. But it refers to the, like the suburbs, I guess, or the city, the small towns around an urban area. Uh, which I think Don sent me a, um, an Economist article, maybe sent to you guys, showing that this para-urban um, population is really growing in Africa. Anyhow, so that's for infrastructure. So now let's talk about the second part, satellites. Uh, there, I think Don uh, said at the start, but we can think of kind of two rough groups of satellites, low Earth orbit satellites and geostationary satellites. Um, geostationary satellites, as you can see here, are already serving Africa and have been for uh, quite a while. You can see the number of, um, of services available in, in each country there on the right. Uh, and they have high capacity, and they're okay for some applications. Um, for example, to watch movies, uh, to stream movies, or to, to download documents. Uh, the reason that that works, they're high up uh, in the in the uh, you know in their orbits, and so they're far. They're a great distance away from the user, and that makes them uh, okay for something like. Um, say streaming a movie. If you're streaming a movie, that first packet, the first little bit of the movie, maybe takes half a second to get to you. You don't care because the second packet is right behind it, and so things can seem kind of uh, smooth. But it doesn't work when you've got that uh, far distance, slow response time for something like what we're doing now in interactive uh, application or surfing the web, where you have many uh, things go up, things come down back and forth uh, rapidly. So that's where these low Earth orbit, the ones that orbit closer to the Earth, um, where they come in. So here's the sort of um, where we are with the low Earth orbit broadband providers. Um, there are 
uh, five. I'm not going to go through these, you know, in, uh, tediously, but uh, just kind of try to differentiate um, amongst them. Uh, the elephant in the room is uh, SpaceX with their Starlink constellation. Uh, you can see uh, they are very much in the home market, the, you know, residential, uh, also mobile uh, serving organizations. Uh, they also have been played a really important, they're playing and have played a really important role in Ukraine in, in the war, both with regard to uh, maintaining military and civilian infrastructure. Uh, and they have a huge lead in launch. They just know how to launch satellites way better than anybody else. We can talk more about that if you want. Um, and they already have a million customers. So they are up and running and selling their service. Uh, the others are not elephants in the room, but they are make, trying to, uh, you know, they're making substantial efforts and they all have something going for them. Uh, so, for for example, the second one is uh, uh, um, you'll tell Sat and uh, OneWeb, and uh, you'll task you'll task you'll task Sat I guess is uh, an established French geo geostationary provider, and they have now acquired OneWeb, which is a low Earth orbit provider. They're not going to do home applications there, but they are going to focus on mobile serving organizations. And a really important niche for them, and they're really uh, going after this, is multi-orbit, where a user can, can be uh, kind of seamlessly using both the low Earth orbit and the geostationary satellites and um, as appropriate, going back and forth automatically between the two. Um, the next uh, when I list there, these are in no particular order. Telsat is a, a Canadian company. They also have, uh, they actually are also a, a geostationary provider. So they have the possibility of doing multi-orbit. I, I talked to them, though, about a year ago. And they said they weren't planning to, but I'm not sure that uh, if I were them, I would. Let's put it that way. Um, and they've, they're uh, not doing home internet. They're, they're going to do mobile and organizations, and they have been delayed. They've had trouble uh, with um, supply supply chain problems, a little trouble raising capital. I'd say they're the shakiest financially on the list. Uh, next is Amazon's Project Kuiper. Uh, they're going to do home mobile organizations, uh, and they have a big advantage in that Amazon has complementary, you know, their cloud infrastructure, all their data centers and stuff. And they also have ground stations as a service. These satellites have to link to something on the ground. And it turns out that uh, Amazon, which is from the start been an um, infrastructure company, uh, they have a service where you can, uh, if you have a satellite, you can use their ground station as a service. Uh, and the final one is uh, super interesting, China SatNet. Um, I'm not sure if, they, I, if, if things, you know, it's kind of inscrutable. I don't know if they're going after the home market or, or which of these markets, but my guess would be all of them. Uh, their, their constellation is, is second in size, second number of satellites to what uh, SpaceX has uh, proposed. Uh, they're behind the others. They got off to a late start. They had a couple of Two small starts that uh, finally got folded into this state-owned China SatNet thing. Uh, but the most interesting thing about them is that they will have access, presumably, or foot up politically and technically to digital Silk Road countries. And here's just a, a kind of a slide showing the extent of the data centers and, and facilities and investments that, that China is making in Africa. Uh, and I think that, that will give them some leverage when they finally get it together uh, for for uh, China SatNet. Um, this these pictures were from 2019, so they need to be updated. But you guys get the uh, the idea, and I'm sure you're really familiar with what China is doing on the continent. Okie doke. Um, <clears throat> It, this is kind of it, low Earth orbit broadband is right now coming to Africa, 
but like it says in parentheses there, it's kind of expensive. Uh, Starlink is right now today, as of, I don't know, three weeks ago, available in Nigeria and Rwanda. Uh, they will be in the countries I've listed there this quarter by the end of the quarter. And by the end of next year, uh, much of the um, African continent will have access to SpaceX's Starlink service. Uh, OneWeb is uh, just about to launch the last batch of their first constellation. Uh, and they've been, uh, they, they've got demonstrations and tests going all over the place already. And I think by uh, next year, they will be the, say early next year, the first, uh, you know, kind of fully online competitor to, uh, to uh, SpaceX. Uh, so it's come to Africa, but as you can see there, uh, the price so far, we've got prices in Nigeria, and you can see that it's expensive. And the prices in Rwanda that have been announced already are, uh, are essentially the same. Um, and also note at this time, they're only selling uh, their kind of low end residential kind of service, but I'm sure the others will, will follow. Okie doke. So that's expensive. So that means uh, that high cost means the sharing is required. And it can be shared, as Don was saying, in libraries, in telecenters, uh, clinics, schools, uh, all that kind of in the organ. That's what I meant by kind of organization uh, sharing, as, as well as businesses, of course. Um, the picture there I show is kind of cool. Uh, this, we're kind of been through this before. That's a picture uh, of the very first telecenter. It was in Lima, Peru, uh, back in the very early uh, early days, the early days of the internet. Um, anyhow, there was a lot of telecenters spread at that time, and in countries like Cuba or something, there's they're still pretty pretty uh, important. Um, anyhow, so that's sharing and tele in. Uh, organizations. And I'm going to say nothing about that because that's what our other uh, speakers are going to address. So let me instead talk about sharing at home. And I'm going to use, I mentioned before, Polo in Internet, their um, experience with, uh, uh, with, with uh, home computing, home connectivity as opposed to mobile. Uh, and they have also, I talk about their home program. Uh, and let me just, that last bullet point, they're not the only one. I know of at least two others. Uh, this is what they do. They share high-speed connections among several homes in a community. Uh, this is their their uh, cost is $1,164. That's at the exchange rate yesterday or something. Uh, and there's a $27 um, installation fee. And they have 20,000 customers. And the service they offer is unlimited connectivity, unlimited fixed connectivity. But you notice it's four megabits. Um, that should be a little b, four megabits per second. And so you say, whoa, you can't, what can you do with four megabits per second? Uh, I've got uh, at my home, I think I got a service that gives me 300 megabits per second. A lot of people have gigabit service. Uh, four sounds really small, uh, but if you put it in perspective, um, it, on the left, you can see that picture of a teletype machine. That was my first home internet terminal, and it ran 10 characters, 10 uppercase characters per second. Uh, and the machine on the right, I was talking with Don, he had one at the same era. Um, that's a uh, my first computer that was connected to the internet. And I had a connection there that was a blazing 300 bits per second. Uh, you can see it's got the dual floppies and, and whatnot. So obviously a low cost computer today uh, can do an awful lot more. And yet I did amazing things with those, those two machines. The one on the left just opened my eyes and the one on the right, uh, it enabled me to quit my day job. Uh, and because I could own my own tools and I could work as a programmer and a consultant and a writer and so, and so forth. So you don't, uh, what you can do today is, is infinitely more with a, a very low cost uh, computer. 
Uh, okay, how does poll work? I'm getting this will be at the end almost. Uh, what they have is a data center in Nairobi, and then they run fiber loops to neighborhoods in that uh, the neighborhoods around uh, uh, Nairobi, and there they set up uh, a wireless point to point and point to multi point uh, wireless distribution you know to what? actually I'm reach the homes at that. Because I am, I I send an email. I hear somebody else that that 400 uh, that. Um, low rate at four megabits per second um okay so that's that's what they're doing today uh, i i think just one little uh, factoid to throw in uh what they are doing to to sort of offer in uh for four megabits per second they pr provision 1.5 megabits uh, for each home and they're assuming that uh they'll, they'll you know, i guess they can almost always deliver the four, but obviously it might not work at a at a high. Uh, it might slow down at a high contention time. Uh, so that's what Poe is doing today, and I think this is the last one. That is what we're here today to talk about. Is this going to be possible tomorrow? And there are many many factors to see whether it's 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 certainly possible, but whether they can substitute it. Um, Satellite, low Earth orbit satellite for that fiber link uh, remains, whether they can do it or economically, um, there's so many factors. I'm not going to say yes or no, but we can uh, speculate and we can uh, consider the factors that go into answering that question. And that's it. Um, here's a couple of things, uh, little short things I've written that you could click on if you want more detail on this. And also, if you want the presentation, you can download it. I just uploaded it to uh, Google Drive. And last but not least, I'm happy to hear from any of you. That's my email address. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent, Larry. Please post those links in the chat, would you? So uh, people can have them. So uh, we can stop your screen share there now. Uh, Great overview of connectivity, Africa. Uh, maybe Stephen, you can do that. Thank you. Well, not yet. I'm going to stop sharing. There you go. Way okay. to go. Thanks. So, a lot of great points you made there, Larry. Uh, besides the fact that you and I are old timers, <laughs> you could have skipped that point, but nevertheless, uh, it. <laughs> It shows an evolution of technology that is accelerating, which is kind of mind boggling uh, at the rate that things are changing and uh, a good description of terrestrial versus uh, extraterrestrial and thought about it that way, uh, connectivity and how it may resolve some of these challenges because the distances are so great and, uh, and uh, uh, affordability challenges are, are great and so you made the key points about uh, shared access and how that is a partial answer. Uh, and our view is that that will help generate demand and demand will cause terrestrial mm -hmm. infrastructure, which we prefer. We all want fiber to the home uh, or, or as close as we can get to uh, to extend. And so over time, I think it, it will make a big difference the great thing is you can reach the farthest, most unconnected remote place today with this technology, assuming the country has given permission to the operators, notably, as you say, uh, this elephant room, Starlink. So now we're going to hear from um, uh, two people who are familiar with uh, specific projects in the two countries that you mentioned, Nigeria and Rwanda, which are the only two so far in Africa that granted Starlink permission to operate. So with us, we have uh, Nakem uh, from the uh, African uh, uh, Federation of Library Associations who helped set up this project. Um, uh, Nakem, are you, are you there? You're there, Nakem. Yes, I'm here. But permit me not to put on my video because of, um, again, internet challenges, please. Well, uh, I, we understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, fine. Well, at least we can we can make your name uh, more prominent. 
tell us tell us about yourself, Nikem, and then uh, tell us about the Nigeria project as it exists today. Uh, let me just say first of all that these projects are not yet fulfilled. They are granted, but not yet fulfilled. So what we're trying to do today is hear hear about these projects and the expectations and plans that have gone into it so that we can then later return to these uh, and hear how they actually have uh, gone. So Nikem, welcome. Thank you very much, Don. So um, I am Nkem, Nkem Osigwe. I'm a Nigerian. I work for African Library and Information Associations and Institutions based in Accra, Ghana. But most often I work from home and um, I know what it is to um, want to have a meeting or want to do something online and you're stuck, you can't do anything. So um, that's just for an introduction. I, I was also head of a public library system here in, in Nigeria before I joined AFLIA. Now, um, Don had started this exchange, you know, this um, thing about Starlink, you know, Leo libraries, he talked about it. Then all of a sudden, hey, they are coming to Nigeria and we got quite excited. We are, we are still excited, even though the, um, the, uh, the project has not really taken off in the five libraries approved as, um, as we would have wanted it to by now. But like I said, now five libraries um, got, uh, um, got uh, the grant, so to speak, of having Starlink in their libraries uh, free for um, 24 months. That's, there'll be free internet in the five libraries, one in Lagos, three in Abuja, and then one in Kaduna. You know, so we are still waiting for that to uh, happen as um, was promised. And uh, but already we've 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 gotten this agreement with the library and um, Starlink, and we are also working to see how we can collect data now. You know, to know what exists now, the kind of uh, internet services that they use the speed challenges and so on so that when this one comes now we can now also get um data from it to know um what changed and um, what it what um the uh, uh, what starlink um was able to help them do but as i was thinking about this today one thing that came to my mind, I asked myself, why libraries? I mean, why libraries? And then um, Larry had said something about it too, you know, that a place where people can share internet because it's free uh, and it's free or is um, cheaper. But beyond that, I, 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 I had a personal experience when I was far, far, far younger. You know, in, in Nigeria, in the um, late 60s, we had this civil war and then um, my part of the country, we lost the war. So it took a long time to build up the um, place again. And in doing that, you know, people were, well, poverty was there and other things. And I remember once my mom wanted to go somewhere and she, she, and she needed to keep me in a place where she felt I'll be safe. And that was my first time of entering the library in, um, in uh, Enugu State then. And why I'm telling this story is why libraries? There's this kind of acceptance that you see in public libraries all over the world. And is the same in Nigeria. And that is one of the reasons why Starlink actually should be in libraries because the internet, it, it, it won't just be for, let's say, people that want to um, come and read or people that use the place often, but it being in um, libraries, it, it, it shows that kind of openness, that kind of anyone can use this, that kind of this thing is accessible to um, everyone, especially our young people, because um, Nigeria is uh, 
we we have a definite youth uh, youth uh, bulge. They are they are young people. We have more people, let's say, between thirty five years to um, twenty years or eighteen years. You know, that's where we have more 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 people. And when you look at at the level of unemployment, when you look at um, facilities available for these young people, you now understand that with Starlink in libraries, these young people can see a place that accepts them the way they are, whatever that they are up to, whatever that um, they want to learn, whatever that they want to find out about, opportunities, um, whether it's for uh, schools or for, uh, uh, or for um, health, purposes or for um, to assess um, government information. So I, I think that that acceptance thing, that, um, that seeing the library as a place where people, everyone is accepted, maybe is one of the reasons why Starlink um, agreed to give uh, five libraries in Nigeria, 24 um, months free internet. But again, we look at all this and we and we think what other opportunities can people have if um, there's free internet in a library that they can easily go into you know it's um, yes it's free it's is um, it's fast it's uh, reliable it's not just um, what you have in your phones because here in Nigeria we use our phones more often for internet, we use our phones for everything, you know. Larry said something about um, creating um, content, you know, that how, how it can, uh, you know, impede you and, and you won't be able to create um, content that laptops are really better. That is true. But when you're in a situation where your phone is the only thing you have, you find out that you have to try everything that you know to see how you can uh, do it. But with libraries, that opportunity to use laptops, desktops exists. And when you now see that really that many people, let's say between 90 to 95% of the young people that, that um, come in, they do not have their own, um, laptops you see that again libraries will provide um or not will they provide those opportunities for these people to create content that they that they could not have done on their phones especially when there's free internet fast internet and so on so that again is another reason why we are looking at that and we are really hopeful that in no distant time that um it will come to be and we want to we want to see how will it change perceptions, not just about um, libraries, but about learning more. You know, because everybody can go to school and you get a certificate, but is that the end of it? So we are looking at the possibility of these young people exploring more when they go to um, libraries and there's that free fast internet to add to the things that they already know so that they can have more opportunities to get jobs to uh, create content to make a living for themselves of course we are also looking at the possibilities of uh, these challenges challenges of um, light power you know uh, what if there's a free fast internet and there's no light to power the uh, devices, what happens? How do we walk around it? So we are looking at that so that um, when this um, um, Starlink thing gets operational, we hope that we can use it to um, advocate to uh, authorities to please, since this thing is free and is fast and it can help young people in this way and that way, that please the light should not be um, a challenge um, in this um, libraries. Then um, we are also looking at um, the possibilities of uh, upskilling the people that work in these libraries. Because if the internet is there, like I said, fast, free, and somebody comes in but doesn't know what to do with it, what happens next? 
I mean, the person will say, okay, it was there, but what did you do with it? So we are looking at how do we upskill this um, librarians and other workers there to know the things, how do you teach your user communities? What can they do with the internet? How do you use it in a responsive and a responsible manner? You know, because um, if they do not know how to do it in um, a responsible way, they could get into problems or they could create difficulties for others. And then also to know um, when you are at this stage that you can do this or, or the other one, but you need more skills in order to create content and in creating content, mind this ethics, how you do this or how you do that. So um, those are the things that we are looking at. Then again, we have looked at this question of um, affordability and we are asking, can libraries really afford to pay um, $600, okay, after, after the um, installation for these five um, libraries and free um, internet for 24 months, the equipment will be there. So the installation is not for them, but for other libraries. Would they be able to afford that $600? Now, in Nigeria, we have this exchange rate, um, Mm, issue because uh, there's an official rate and then there's um which is difficult to um ask, which is difficult to assess and then there's one that you can assess easily and today i asked a question about this i asked somebody how much is six hundred dollars if i want to uh, let's say i want to buy it for me to pay for this sterling how much is it and it's close to 450,000 Naira. Now, 450,000 Naira, somebody may say is not much, but you know, in, um, in, in, in a country where the, uh, um, the minimum wage is 30,000 Naira, you see that it's difficult to uh, cope with and then the monthly thing. So um, we are looking forward to this. We, we are aware of the um, opportunities that it will give us. And we are also trying to, to see how we can cope with the um, challenges that we know that we are going to face. Thank you, Don. I'm, uh, I'm done, Don. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nikim. Wow, <laughs> you, you've touched on so many powerful points here. I uh, like the, the ability for the library to show the value of uh, a, a, a desktop or a laptop computer compared to the use of the phone. Larry made the point, but how do you know that? People just tell you and you, and you need to experience. This is what libraries have done is give this uh, uh, hands-on experience to things. There's a bunch of other things you touched on. I'd like to hope we can get back to it, but we need to turn to Varengai now and tell us, Varengai, welcome. Uh, tell us about yourself and, of course, what, what you've learned about the, uh, the Rwanda project, uh, which is compared to Nigeria, where Starlink has donated five enterprise business class systems to libraries that they've yet to deliver those because they haven't really set up that particular service yet. Uh, in uh, Rwanda, I think it's different for the schools. Maybe there, anyway, we'll learn about that. But just to say that, that the enterprise system is much more expensive than the consumer system but it's, you know, provides more bits per second. But how relevant is that when you're starting from, you know, four or none, uh, what remains to be seen. But uh, welcome, Varengai. Tell us, uh, tell us what's happening in Rwanda, what you can share with us. Great. Uh, thank you, Don, and uh, greetings again, colleagues. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, please Hi. confirm. I'm also worried about uh, the internet connect uh, connectivity that my colleague from uh, Nigeria mentioned. But I'm confident I will finish uh, this uh, quick uh, talk uh, without any disturbances. So firstly, quickly, my, my name is Verengai Mabika, and I'm working with Internet Society as Senior Policy Advisor for, for the Africa region. I, I do work very closely with the, our engagement team to maintain relationships with governments and also do policy advocacy around the issues that we are working on. 
is uh, I would say uh, quickly as ISOC, uh, we, are, we are very much interested in LEOS uh, from, from the perspective that uh, this actually provides an opportunity uh, for low latency high speed connections. And we, we believe that it could be a game changer for uh, the number of issues that uh, my colleagues mentioned before. Larry, I think you mentioned quite a lot of some of the use cases, community centers, libraries, and, uh, and, and even in individual. So uh, getting quickly, because I'm also looking at the time, uh, getting quickly to the situation in Rwanda. So quickly, just some quick highlights. Uh, Rwanda is a East African country with a population of about 13.5 uh, million people. It's uh, actually quite uh, uh, um, uh, recorded as a, a very um, a leader in innovation and technology, I would say in the region, it's actually um, respected for that. And uh, the president and the government has been doing quite a lot of uh, you know, in innovative things to improve the, um, the economic uh, situation, the economic outlook of the country. Um, so when it comes to internet, um, Rwanda is just, the internet penetration in Rwanda is just 23%. Uh, well, I think for this year, the estimates for this year, it's actually 26%. So you, you, you can tell that this is actually very, very low. 26%, uh, 20, I think it's, it's, it's quite, quite low for, for a population of 13 million uh, people. So I assume that uh, the Starlink project while it's uh, initially targeting uh, schools, I think the intention for the government is also to make sure that it can actually go to the places where internet is, um, is currently not available. So ju just to share with you that uh, with regards to, um, um, I think it was re reported in the a few weeks back that uh, Starling has started operations in, um, in Rwanda. So uh, firstly, um, the, the, the government of Rwanda uh, he had um, an initial idea to connect uh, schools firstly with uh, using uh, SpaceX Starlink um, uh, uh, connectivity. So there are about 6,700 schools in Rwanda and uh, the, the government is aiming to connect about 3,000 schools by the end of uh, 2024. Uh, so this is a very ambitious uh, very ambitious um, goal as, as you can see. In fact, is some news that I read around um, it, it, the government is actually secured some funding for this. So um, about 30 million US dollars is coming from uh, China Exim Bank and uh, the other remaining balance is also coming from a World Bank uh, development project. So um, the uh, last, last year, uh, the Rwanda Space Agency, they actually do have a a very active uh, space agency signed an MOU with uh, the Global Satellite Operators Association to explore ways of um, improving rural connectivity and accelerate digital inclusion. So this was a one of the biggest policy ch uh, changes that actually um, enabled Starlink to get into the space. Uh, I, I think um, uh, uh, you you would notice that um, I think Larry also mentioned this that some policy challenges in a greater part of Africa makes it very difficult for, uh, for, for, for you know, Leo players to get into, the, to, to, into countries. But uh, this, this MOU actually enabled uh, Rwanda to do that. So SpaceX uh, from the, um, the initial um, plan which they announced, they, they, they are going to be piloting a connectivity to 500 schools. In, and this is uh, beginning the, the beginning the end of March. So I would say on the ground, we haven't had any work going on yet. Um, I think they are still uh, doing the administrative work for that. I would say for a um, agreement that was signed on the 20, 22nd of February, I think it's fairly early to say uh, we should expect to see uh, anything you know, reasonable on the ground. But this is the plan. They plan to connect 500 schools in, 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 the, in, the, in the first year. So um, because they are going to be connecting schools, I think the idea of libraries here naturally comes in almost all of the schools. They've got libraries. But uh, like I mentioned, because of the internet penetration rate, I suspect that the idea is also to then encourage communities around those, li around those schools 
to also come and use uh, the services. What I'm not sure yet now is um, if uh, they are going to be allowing sharing of that uh, internet connectivity. And maybe quickly just to mention one another important aspect, uh, which is the cost. I think this is important. So uh, initially, the, the, the initial costs, again, the hardware cost is getting to around 599 US dollars. I've tried to do the exchange uh, and then a, 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 a non-refundable um, amount of 100 USD and, and a, a monthly fee of uh, US $43. Uh, dollars. So this is the more or less uh, the kind of cost that we're seeing in Nigeria. So I'm not sure if uh, this um, package is going to, to apply also to institutions and if they're going to be likely, you know, um, allowing people to, to share this. Let me pause there because I'm looking at the time and probably we may want to get into some kind of discussion. Uh, you. Renge, thank you. You've led us right into the heart of the discussion, I think, which is uh, affordability and availability. So uh, from what we understand, the uh, you know, the stratification of the services, you've got this consumer level or residential service, and you have this enterprise business service, which is substantially more expensive, as is the hardware uh, at that uh, $2,500 for this, this enterprise level uh, service. But there is no, uh, there's no prohibition on sharing. There's only a prohibition on reselling. So uh, the the consumer or the residential service at 50, 100 megabits, 150 megabits, it's it's variable depending on how many people are trying to share it. Which in Africa, there's nobody trying to share it so far. So it should perform very well. Uh, and so the. There's, uh, as I say, if there's no resale involved, then there's no prohibition on sharing. So this enables libraries or schools or community centers or anyone to uh, extend the, the use of it as far as uh, it will go. Uh, there's a question about whether or not you can connect a wide area network to this, but I think it's the same principle. If you're not reselling it, then it's just more people using it. They do have a, um, a one terabyte uh, threshold on data use per subscription. Well, that's, that's quite a lot. I think uh, the average in the US right now is uh, uh, for a household is much less than that uh, uh, per month. And even then, it's not a throttle like with your uh, cell phone. You know, you hit your data cap and they send you down to, you know, just a few uh, few megabits or a few bits almost per second until the next month. This is not that. What it means is you're deprioritized. If there's contention, if there are more people, uh, you know, trying to access it, then you have a lower priority. But if they're not, then you're just operating. You don't even know about it. So it it's very different than than throttling, uh, and, and it should not impact usage. Certainly in the first you know couple of years uh, at least. So the question is then uh, the the cost of the hardware, the six hundred dollar uh, purchase, as you say, non refundable, and then the ongoing monthly for the residential level service, which should be adequate for most of these small enterprises at uh, you know under $50 US a month. So we're hoping that communities can pool their resources to come up with that. Uh, it seems reasonable uh, as a price for a whole community or you know even if it's just their, their center is being served. It's not just connectivity for individuals, just that this important institution has uh, more capability to it. So that uh, that seems like a combination to to really proliferate. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to find out, right? We, we, we don't know what the impact is going to be. Uh, uh, and so trying it out is just really a good way to find out what's the impact on the wider community. Uh, what are the other issues related to I mean, you said it's it, that 500 is a, is a large number or 1,000 is a large number to implement in a short amount of time. That's absolutely true for terrestrial infrastructure because you have to, you know, run wires and build towers. And stuff. But this with this stuff, you just mail out a box. You just mail it out and you plug it in, set it up. You're live. 
So that's the easy part. Uh, the more challenging part is in what what else is needed. Do you need more devices? Do you, uh, do you need people that have more knowledge about how to use it and how to train people how to use it? So those are the kind of things which may be uh, challenging to, to scale as compared to the actual connectivity portion of it. So it's a, it's a disconnect from where, where we've experienced this all in the past. And, and it's really fascinating to see how it's going to unfold and how it may make a difference. Uh, across Africa. Uh, I appreciated your uh, your estimation, uh, both from you and Larry, that, uh, that this will uh, be adopted more quickly. Um, uh, do you have any sense that the African Union is involved? You mentioned the XM Bank of China and the World Bank financing these projects. Do you have a sense the African Union has uh, any kind of a stake in this? Have you had any interaction with them? Um, okay, sorry. Thanks, Don. No, no, not at the moment. I I just know that there are some discussions ongoing uh, around Leo um, uh, companies are coming into Africa, and quite a number of governments, also individual individual governments, are looking forward to all the uh, you know announcements that are being made. But but uh, policy making regulation is normally very slow in Africa. It normally starts from the African Union point of view and then scale down to to, to the country level. And uh, are we if 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 we don't have anything at this point, it's most likely that uh, only the individual countries that are more open minded are the ones that will uh, catch up the you know the early uh, benefits like Rwanda and probably Nigeria. They've made some. Um, you know, policy inroads for, for, for that. Right, right. It is it is a national prerogative to grant this permission. That's absolutely true. And it is a slow process to go through all those. Uh, and these leading countries like Nigeria, Rwanda, Kenya, South Africa tend to be the ones that kind of set the pace for various kinds of uh, regulations around telecommunications. So uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how this all rolls out. Um, now, Kim, you mentioned what you thought the impact would be on uh, young people and how you thought they might be. What What did you say about that, uh, Nikim? Do you recall? Yes, you know, you see, uh, we we place quite a lot of emphasis on the strategic case we get when we go to school. You know, you you. you finish this grade, you get a certificate, um, you, you do this one, you get a certificate, but sometimes at the end of it, it's as if learning stops. It's as if some of the things that I even learned in school, you know, are not really the practical things, so to speak. But libraries with internet that is fast and free, you know, or cheap, quite cheap, can help people to continue learning, especially these young people that have the future right there in front of them. Because they can't just rely on the only thing, all those things that they learned in school. Uh, let's stop there. We are now ready for the world. We are now ready to do all things. No, 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 no. We feel that libraries should help them to learn more. And because um, knowledge has migrated to online spaces, you know, the internet can help them where it is available, where it is stable, where it is fast, where it is cheap, if not free, help them to continue to learn. Then also this idea, you see, um, you had talked about YouTube when you were starting. Remember, Don, you say something about uh, um, the um, number of uh, things that go there every day. People are creating content. And young people are very good at that, better than older people like us. And you know, this availability of internet in, in libraries can help them try out things that maybe when they now go home, they can now say, let me do this or do that. So, you know, the world is, um, it, it, it has just gone beyond what you learn in school. It, it, it won't be enough for you to um, meet the challenges in, in um, today's world or, or excel, say young people. They need more. They need more. And the internet can help them to, to um, get all that. Wonderful. That was what you asked, right? Yeah, that's exactly what, what uh, I recall and more. Uh, I think that's a, a marvelous observation to, uh, to close this session with is, is the opportunities that, uh, 
that the internet at a at a communal site, community site, can offer to so many people. Uh, your point about uh, uh, learning beyond school, lifelong learning is a common term we use for that, is right on. And libraries uniquely offer these kinds of learning environments uh, uh, for uh, for anybody about anything. And you know, this is these life skills are really what gets us through it. Uh, so um, we're a little bit over, but this is not a TV show, so we don't have a hard stop. But then I'd like to uh, uh, go go back to Larry for a final comment, and then Veringa, we're going to let you have a, also a final uh, comment. So Larry, thanks. Something you'd like to add at the close here? I guess one thing that um, <clears throat> comes to mind, one, it's, it's been really uh, interesting hearing about the, the two projects. Um, and I want to I want to hear more. I want to learn more. Well, but, you know, cost has come up a number of times, and it's a real moving target. Uh, like the $600 terminal, um, that the price of that will go down. Uh, there is competition coming. Amazon has just uh, the other day announced uh, the description of the three terminals they're going to be selling. Um, and, and with competition, and with technical progress, on especially on the terminal side, those prices will come down. So the economics today are not necessarily um, the economics tomorrow. I think the final thing I'd say is, is what Don brings up, constraints, um, uh, con contractual constraints, difficulties <clears throat> with both the, go the government, local governments, and also working out terms with, with the providers. Uh, like if for that home, the picture I painted of, of what Paula is doing, for example, of going uh, substituting satellite link for the uh, their own fiber link. Uh, right now, SpaceX would ostensibly not allow that. That would have to be negotiated to to uh, to let the community network um, serve serve uh what what they were getting from Poa. uh and if spacex won't do it uh the others um amazon might do it uh, one web might do it they're more focused on on that sort of uh, uh you know not to individuals distribution so um everything's changing it's hard to say how uh how it's no, going to shake great, out it's a great point larry uh, that there's a lot to learn a lot to unfold uh, and we'd be looking forward to competition in this in this particular space totally. uh, to uh, to drive innovation and and uh, price as well. So, uh, uh, Verengai, uh, final word for us today. Yes, um, th thank you, Don. And I think this was an interesting uh, discussion. Maybe two points that I wanted just to mention. Uh, I've had informal discussions with some of uh, the regulators or the um, the policymakers and. One 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 I, one issue they mentioned is uh, competition. I think Larry mentioned that as well. They, you you notice that in most African countries, uh, there are two or three big telco companies, and one is associated with the government. So they are also looking at uh, you know the potential to lose income and uh, maybe market share because of uh, uh, the competition that will come with this with this. Uh, uh, new options. And then, of course, capacity. I think we, we also need to start thinking seriously about capacity, you know, support, technical support for all these uh, um, imaging um, uh, technologies, because uh, most of our universities, I, I, I think there are just a few or even, you know, companies that are getting into training, uh, technical support and uh, things like that. So I think these are two points that we need to keep on the agenda is, as we discuss the issue forward. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Though. And thank you so much. Uh, good points again, all. Uh, and we will, in fact, uh, return to this conversation. This is kind of the opening entry into this particular uh, subject uh, for Africa, which is so exciting. So we'll, uh, we'll hope you all can come back and we can uh, uh, reassess this in maybe a, a two, three months and see what has transpired and what our expectations are matching reality at that point. So with that, I think we will uh, close the session and end the recording.
Come back next time.